This video was sponsored by Everwinter, a new gaming convention in Boston, Massachusetts. More about them later in the video. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and it seems like just yesterday, most of the content creators on YouTube, as well as the Warhammer community team themselves, were kind of pooping on Space Marines for being not a very good faction. They didn't get a huge change in the most recent data slate, only receiving a buff to one of their secondaries, and came in with one of the lowest win rates of the entire metagame. But despite that, leave it to the Space Marine community to come back swinging and put up some huge results immediately upon that data slate becoming legal. Because today we're going to be talking about the results from the US Open Kansas City, where Zach Kerstatter went 8 and 0 with a Blood Angels list. As always in these list review videos, we're going to be doing a little bit of a review of the event that the list participated in. We're going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the list themselves and all the matchups that it played against. In this case, we're also going to dive a little bit into where Blood Angels are coming from and some of the reasons that they weren't doing so well in the previous metagame and maybe doing a lot better in this one. As always, if you enjoy my content, remember to drop a like and a subscribe on the video. I really appreciate it, and let's get into it. So while Space Marines as a whole was pretty trodden upon in the pre-Data Slate season, Blade Angels did come in as one of the highest win rate sub-factions. That still only brought them to around a 45%. That said, with the metagame and Data Slate changing a lot of things, the meta has become a lot more conducive to the type of playstyle that Blood Angels wants to play. Blood Angels as a faction relies very heavily on not only standard power-armored infantry like Death Company and Incursors with a 3 plus save and Armor of Contempt, but also their Sanguinary Guard, which bring in a 2 plus save alongside that Armor of Contempt and allows that to compound with effects like Light Cover. Previously, a focus on very high AP weapons to punch through other Armor of Contempt armies made it very difficult for those Sanguinary Guard to survive. But as the meta is developing, we're seeing a big shift towards high volume, low AP attacks. This is a huge result of the Chaos Demons Codex, since those high volume, low AP attacks are not only effective against demons, given that your AP value doesn't matter against Demonic Invulnerability, but also also, the Chaos Demons bring Zinch Flamers into almost every Chaos sub-faction. Those Zinch Flamers put out a ton of AP2 shooting, which, if you're firing at a Sanguinary Guard benefiting from light cover, is actually going to be reduced to effectively AP0, and gives the Blood Angels player a pretty good opportunity to survive. This shift in the metagame has made the Blood Angels army a lot tougher to kill, and certainly helps their win rate. In addition, their single worst matchup in the meta, that being High Fleet Leviathan Tyranids, which they, in the pre-Data Slate season, had an abysmal 25% percent win rate against was heavily nerfed in the data slate, making the transhuman effect that effectively gave Sanguinary Guard, who would typically wound Toughness 5 enemies like Tyranid Warriors on 2s, essentially minus 2 to wound, given that they could only wound most of the Tyranid army on 4s. That's in addition to the reinforced Hive Node stratagem the Tyranids could pull out to have the damage on the Encarmine weapons that Sanguinary Guard were bringing, or even drop a Thunder Hammer that a Death Company Marine would be swinging down to only 2 damage, essentially having the damage of every unit in the Blood Angels Codex. So when your mind is two to wound and your damage is halved, it's not a good look for you, and that brought them to a 25% win rate in that matchup. However, that archetype for Tyranids is no longer viable. And while other Tyranid archetypes are similarly effective against Blood Angels, they are harder to play, and a lot of players are dropping them for easier to play armies. So with their natural predator out of the meta, and a lot of armies moving to archetypes that Blood Angels are much better against, I think the scene is set for Blood Angels to do pretty well. That's on top of the event being a US Open event. The US Open Kansas City appropriately used the US Open terrain format, which gives huge bricks of line of sight blocking terrain with the obscuring keyword in mirrored sections of the table. This gives armies easy access to line of sight blocking in pretty relevant positions, especially positions that give Blood Angels 15-ish inch plus a charge threat range good access to at least the middle of the table and sometimes your opponent's deployment zone. In addition, easy access to light cover means that units like Sanguinary Guard who are benefiting from that two plus save and armor of contempt are extremely hard to kill in that terrain format. Now the US Open format does do some interesting things. It is an eight round event playing three full days, but cuts all of the players after round four into brackets of 16. This means that if you're among the top 16 after the first four rounds of the day, you can only play those other top 16 players. This can skew the results a little bit since high scoring armies, of which Blood Angels can be one, typically drift towards the top of the event early and then are locked into a top 16 place. That said, you still have to win eight games of 40K consecutively in order to win the event. And so getting to that 
that 8 and 0 position at all is extremely difficult, almost regardless of the opponents that you're playing. All told, the event had 186 players, putting it in the realm of a very large major level event, at least for the United States scene. Moving on, we'll talk about the list that Zach chose to play. Now, Blood Angel slits tend to be relatively similar. As I said before, they do focus very heavily on those Sanguinary Guard. This list was composed of a patrol and vanguard detachment, the patrol being led by Commander Dante, who is the warlord, to grant his one CP bonus to the army. We also had Lamartis with Mantra of Strength and Canticle of Hate to give an additional bonus to charge to the army, although importantly, it doesn't stack with the Blood Angel's chapter tactic. It does give you the opportunity to switch out the chapter tactics built in plus one to charge for a more effective plus two to charge. The additional distance on pile in and consolidates as well that the litany gives you is a very big deal, especially units inside a rights of war aura who get objective secured and can use that additional movement to steal objectives away from enemies. We have a unit of incursors filling out that troop slot, as well as two units of five death company marines, four of which are packing thunder hammers. We're going to see a very heavy emphasis on death company in Zach's list here, which is largely to turn on access to the fury of the lost secondary objective. That secondary is going to score you points if a unit was destroyed by a death company unit, which is typically pretty easy given that a death company unit is basically like a nuclear missile that can go in and pick basically any one thing in the game and probably kill it, then also scores you a point if a death company unit was destroyed that turn, meaning that each time a death company unit trades in this way, it's going to net you four points. And if ever your death company aren't killed by your opponent, you can then have the opportunity to try to kill a second unit, allowing you to max the objective. A lot of Blood Angels lists more recently have been focusing on this objective to give you another secondary objective pick in matchups where you don't have easy ones to take. In that Vanguard detachment, we're also bringing a Sanguinary Priest with Rites of War, a third unit of Death Company Marines. This one only armed with chain swords in order to clear Chaff Infantry, so you can do so cost effectively without having to trade the more expensive Thunderhammer armored models. A Sanguinary Agent with the Soul Warden Warlord trait and the Wrath of Ball Relic. This guy gives you an additional bonus to your movement speed, increasing the threat range of that Blood Angels army pretty significantly, and Soul Warden is important to keep mortal wounds from punching through your Sanguinary Guard's heavy saves. That gives you a 5 plus damage ignore against mortal wounds and makes your army a little bit more effective against psychic powers. From there, we have the classic three units of Sanguinary Guard, this time all packing in Carmine Swords alongside a mix of Inferno Pistols. Following that up, we have some support utility units, a unit of five Assault Marines with a couple Plasma Pistols and Inferno Pistols in there because they are free upgrades now. This unit is very good for completing actions, putting banners down, retrieving Nephilim data, for example, and for a relatively cheap points cost with the Blood Angels Chapter Tactic and potentially Super Doctrine in play, can actually pack a pretty good punch. We have an Eliminator Squad with last few seals and an Instigator Bolt Carbine, a very effective unit at screening or just being a utility unit. For only 75 points, getting a couple last few soul shots that can then move into line of sight blocking terrain, thanks to the Instigator Bolt Carbine in the unit, means that you're going to continue to generate value from them. Also being high strength, three damage weapons makes them good at killing enemy Terminators, which is a pretty big deal against matchups like Chaos Space Marines. Last but certainly not least, we have a Whirlwind with a Castellan Launcher. This gives the list a little bit of indirect fire, but most importantly, gives you access to the stratagem to force opponents to fight last. In an army like this that is almost entirely based on dealing damage in the fight phase, having fight phase manipulation and stopping your opponents from being able to interrupt on you and making it more difficult for them to charge you and alpha strike you makes the Whirlwind an absolute necessity. Generally speaking, these lists tend to play relatively conservatively and use their Death Company Marines to push across the table and score secondaries. The rest of the army can play relatively far back and use their threat range to threaten the center of the table, hiding behind line of sight blocking terrain so that they don't get shot too much before they go in and punishing opponents for pushing out of their own deployment zone. Alongside the Sanguinary Priest, giving all of the Sanguinary Guard objective secured thanks to Rites of War and Unbridled Ardor, allowing those Sanguinary Guard squads to heroically intervene. It's also difficult to take objectives away from the Blood Angels player, since oftentimes they'll outnumber you with objective secured units, and if you touch their objectives, you give them the opportunity to heroically intervene into you and kill you at the end of your turn. Overall, it's a relatively standard Blood Angels list, but I think it's important to note that focus on Death Company, because unlocking that last secondary is a very big deal for scoring consistently over an eight round event. Now we'll go on to talking about all of the matchups that the list played, but before, we do have a sponsor for this video, so we're going to hear a word from them. Now, I'm no expert, but I have a sneaking suspicion that if you enjoy my miniature game-focused YouTube channel, you probably also enjoy miniature games and tournaments. Which is why I'm excited to announce that this video has been sponsored by Everwinter. Everwinter is a brand new tabletop gaming convention being held in Boston, Massachusetts on December 10th through 11th. 
This is a general gaming convention and will have a wide selection of events and vendors available, including an Age of Sigmar GT and Blood Bowl events, Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, Malifo, Infinity, and most excitingly, a 100 player Warhammer 40K Major. Seriously, look at all these people signed up. Oh my God, so many people. In addition to all the games you're gonna get to play at the convention, all of these events do have huge prize support as well. The organizers have sent me over a little sneak peek at some of the Age of Sigmar prizes, and Warhammer 40k is gonna have a similar level of support in addition to those amazing bragging rights, goodies from local game stores, and sweet, sweet ITC points. I'll also be around the convention all weekend live streaming the 40k Major, so come hang out with me. Check out wickeddicey.com slash everwinter for more information on the Everwinter Gaming Convention. And visit the Hyatt Regency in Boston on December 10th through 11th for an incredible weekend of awesome gaming. I'll see you there. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's talk about some matchups. I do want to give a shout out to Brent Simon, a, a good friend of mine from the old War Machine days, who we will be talking about later in this video, who did get me a list of the missions that were played in each round, so we can talk about each of these matchups holistically. First off, in round one was Drew Richardson's Tau. This is a Tau Sept Battalion, bringing Shadow Sun and Ethereal with the Humble Stave, as well as Long Strike with his Warlord trait. A couple of Breacher teams and Crude Carnivores to fill out the troop slot, one big Crisis Battlesuit team. Interestingly, a big Stealth Battlesuit team, which is not something we see very often, alongside some Pathfinders, two Riptide Battlesuits, and a Hammerhead Gunship. I think this matchup is mostly determined by how quickly the Blood Angels can close that distance without getting torn apart by the Riptides on the way in. Having that large quantity of Death Company certainly helps, especially if the Blood Angels go first, because they're often able to Alpha Strike at least one thing out of the opponent's army, and then set up, forcing the opponent to deal with the one unit of Death Company that's in their deployment zone to deliver more Death Company and Sanguinar Guard on the subsequent turn. I imagine that's how the game ended up turning out, because it was a 99 to 51 point win for Zack. That moved us on to round two against Scott Bleggins, Adeptus Custodes. This was on Abandoned Sanctuaries, which does throw a little bit of a wrench in the works of the Blood Angels army, meaning that they cannot use their Forlorn Fury to move their Death Company outside their deployment zone. This means that the Alpha Strike that Blood Angels are able to do is a little bit hampered, but the fact that they have such a long threat range, being able to move 14 inches thanks to Wrath of Ball, and then charge at plus one or plus two, depending on whether Canticle of Hate is up, makes it easy for them to threaten through the center of the table. This means that if the Adeptus Custodes are able to to move in and get a foothold in the middle, they're just gonna be beta struck by the Blood Angels. The fact that Scott's list was also very reliant on Virtus Praetors means that it didn't have a lot of objective secured. And while it was good at hitting those Sanguinary Guard with Salvo Launchers once they actually leave cover, there's not really an impetus for Zack to do that. And I think that ended up hampering the Adeptus Custodes army because this was another 99 point win for Zack. In round three, he actually had the Mirror Match, playing against Sri Rombobili's Blood Angels. This is on Tide of Conviction and ended up as an 83 to 53 point win. While Tide of Conviction does allow players to Alpha Strike their opponents pretty highly, you almost want to go second and receive that Alpha Strike in this matchup because of the tertiary objective in the mission scoring so many points at the end of the game. This makes it a relatively low scoring game, so a 53 point score for Sri Rom is not out of the realm of possibility. That said, the 83 points for Zen Zach certainly tell me that he was able to survive until that late game and score all those additional points. There's also something to be said for the person who went undefeated in the event with Blood Angels playing against an almost identical Blood Angels army, and probably there being some play scale differential in there. That moved us on to round four, where Zach was up against Jeremy Capco's Space Wolves. It's always cool to see Space Wolves at the X and O slot. This is a Vanguard detachment out of a successor running Warded and Whirlwind of Rage, giving them a little bit of defense against Mortal Wounds. That's in order to protect the three Redemptor Dreadnoughts in the list, alongside a bunch of Wolfguard and some interesting Hounds of Morkai, which I like to see. Space Wolves can be a little bit difficult for other armies to engage into them because they do have a lot of fight phase manipulation with the Armor of Rust forcing units to fight last and Murderous Hurricane potentially putting fight last on a unit. That said, they certainly don't hit as hard as Sanguinary Guard and with the mass number of multi-damage attacks that the Blood Angels have once they get stuck in, even forcing them to fight last doesn't really do much to mitigate their damage output since just a few Sanguinary Guard with their 
high volume of two damage attacks can kill a ton of opposing space marines. We also had a very heavy reliance on Redemptor Dreadnoughts in this situation, and if the Blood Angels player can skirt their line of sight and not get engaged by them, that can make things a lot easier. Moving on, we had Kyle McCord's Mixed Imperium. This is an interesting list that I've actually played almost exactly against in the past, using a Militar on Patrol coming out of a custom regiment using gunnery experts and spotter details, alongside two tank commanders and some infantry squads to grant objective secured, alongside a Grey Knight's Patrol out of Prussian Brethren. This patrol bringing a Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knight alongside Kaldor Drago, some units of Interceptors, two standard Dread Knights, and five more Grey Knight Strike Marines. With the extreme damage output that Militarum guns and artillery can produce, that does force your opponent to come out in the open and actually engage with them, which is exactly where Grey Knights want to be. Grey Knights can, if all of their psychic powers get cast, have an absolutely incredible damage output in melee. That said, it does break all of the faction effects for the Grey Knights patrol, so that detachment doesn't have as quite as many abilities as they would in a normal Grey Knights army. That certainly didn't help Kyle because he went down 92 to 67. Now I should say that this is after the cut to the top 16, so once these top 16 were determined, they could only play against each other. And it's no surprise that Zach was in that top 16 slot with two 99 point wins and one 100. Tide of Conviction tends to score relatively low across the board, so even an 83 point win on Tide of Conviction means that Zach was probably ahead of the pack on battle point scoring. Now moving on deeper into that top 16, Zach was matched up against his first demon player of the event, his first of many. This is against Mark H. Chaos Demons, bringing a pretty interesting build, focusing on a ton of greater demons, bringing a Bloodthirster with Argath the King of Blades and Devastating Blow, alongside Scarbrand, Bellacor, and Kairos Fateweaver. It has that ever-present three units of five Flamers and some Chaff Infantry to help out. Now, generally speaking, I love the inclusion of the Flamers and Kairos Fateweaver. That gives you a ton of reach alongside Bellacor's ability to teleport the Flamers around, to do mortal wounds from Kairos with his enormous bonuses to cast, and to pick out specific enemy units with those Flamers. The downside here is that the rest of the list is based on doing damage in melee, and it's lampshaded pretty heavily by the inclusion of Scarbrand. Scarbrand is a big bloodthirster who gives plus one attack to every unit within six inches, with a rider that they then cannot fall back. This means that while your opponent is generally better at hitting Scarbrand than they normally would be, because he's making them so angry, they don't have the opportunity to escape him, and his significantly better damage output is going to put them in the dirt. If you can set up a turn where Scarbrand can warp Locus out of Bellicor, for example, engage two units and kill one of them, the second one can't fall back, your opponent can't shoot at Scarbrand, and he'll probably survive to kill the second unit and continue the path. The downside there is if you play against a melee army, because then Scarbrand's aura becomes a pretty problematic issue for you. Not only can you not fall back from them, so if we do have any flamers accidentally standing near Scarbrand and they get engaged, they are just stuck in there unless Bellacor can extricate them with a shrouded step, but also everyone's getting plus one attack attacking everyone around Scarbrand. That means we could see Sanguinary Guard swinging in with enormous numbers of attacks, all of which are pretty good at dealing damage to greater demons. That certainly came into play as this was a 92 to 66 win in favor of Zack. That moved us on to the semifinals, where Zach played against my friend Brent Simon. Brent was running also Chaos Demons, and this time a very interesting build. This was running a patrol and vanguard detachment, taking Bellacor alongside three units of blood letters and two skull cannons followed up by a second Vanguard detachment with two Fate Skimmers, all of them packed to do massive damage with Bolts of Change fueled by Retinues of Horrors. We had three units of Six Flamers and two Burning Chariots as well, making this a pretty decent gun line between the three damage shots from the Burning Chariots and the two damage shots from the Skull Cannons and all of the hits from the Flamers. I think the downside here is that we had a little bit of a lack of Mortal Wounds. While the Skates and Fate Skimmers are pretty good at casting, they aren't quite as good as Kairos or a Lord of Change. Now talking to Brent about the game, he also said that he lost one of those Fate Skimmers early, thanks to a little bit of a mistake on deployment. It can be very difficult to measure out exactly where you need to be to screen out a hit from a Death Company squad if you're alternating deployments, and even allowing a little sliver of a chance for a Death Company squad to Forlorn Fury and move up to your deployment zone, and then if the Blood Angels player is going first, immediately activate, move again, and charge almost anything they want. And while it is screenable, it forces the Demon player to put a lot of their infantry on the table to fill up that real estate. That means that there's less models demonically manifesting in, to engage enemy units on their objectives and to steal their objectives away, and you lose a lot of expensive demon infantry early in the game when you'd rather not. Unfortunately, in this case, this allowed Zank to get a Fate Skimmer from Brent's army pretty early, and things were downhill from there, leading to a 91-53 win for the Blood Angels. And that put Zach in the finals, where he was up against an army including demons for the third time in 
the event. This was Manny Chima's Mixed Zinch, where he played a Thousand Suns Battalion, bringing Araman, an Exalted Sorcerer, and an Infernal Master with the Umbralific Crystal, alongside five units of Rubric Marines, one packed out with Warp Flamers, and the rest just with their standard Bolters, a unit of nine Scarab Occult Terminators, interestingly, without any of their heavy weapons, a couple Zangor Enlightened to perform actions, a Chaos Spawn, and a Demon's Vanguard, that bringing a Fate Skimmer and three more units of five Flamers. I talked about this list at length, in my interview with Liam Vissel, you can go check that out. I'll drop a link in the video right now where he played the same list to an undefeated record at the Alliance Open. The list is extremely strong, packs an immense number of mortal wounds from all of those Rubric Marines and powerful Thousand Suns casters, alongside having incredible control of the midboard. With the relatively slow and tanky nature of Scarab Occult Terminators, they're still pretty good at plotting through the center and clearing enemy screens. That means you're basically just forced to walk into the optimal threat range of the Thousand Suns army in order to screen out multiple flamer units from dropping directly into your face. Thousand Suns do have a little bit of a weakness in not having a lot of ranged attacks, but this army does supersede that by effectively forcing you to screen it out. It basically makes the flamers into its long ranged weapons by just throwing them from the warp directly into weapons range of you and then forcing you to deal with them. And if you screen that out so that doesn't happen, you're just feeding units into the Thousand Suns army. Now this game was streamed over on the Games Workshop stream. I think you can go check that out if you are a subscriber to their channel over on the Purple channel. Unfortunately, I didn't watch it myself, so I didn't catch exactly what happened here, but it was a barn burner of a game at a 75 to 74 point final score, leading to a one point differential to put Zach in the top of the event. Generally speaking, I think that the Chaos Demons matchup into Blood Angels is relatively even. Chaos Demons don't have the best profiles at killing Sanguinary Guard, although they do have a lot of mortal wounds, which certainly helps. And once their Greeter Demons get stuck in, they can start killing Sanguinary Guard pretty effectively. The downside is that they're relatively fragile against melee attacks, which makes Blood Angels good at killing them back, but overall puts the matchup to something of a coin flip. And the fact that Zack was able to beat that essentially three times in a row means that I think that he was very practiced with the matchup. Chaos Demons and camp mixed cast lists bringing chaos demons are certainly going to be the boogeymen of the meta game going forward so if you are a player of any faction you should definitely read up on what they do you don't want to get caught out by any of these chicanerous demon tricks overall congratulations to zach for taking it down with an 8 and 0 undefeated record that's absolutely incredible and with an army that was previously underperforming blood angels certainly weren't the worst army in the game although the space marine super faction in general has been on a significant downturn there have been a couple standard bears for the faction who have been doing pretty well and it seems like zach has established himself as one of them anyway that's it for this video let me know that down in the comments what you think about zach's blood angels army and if there are were any space marine armies you'd like to try to go 8 and 0 at a us open with big thanks to everwinter for sponsoring this video check them out at wickeddicey.com everwinter also thanks to everyone who watched all the way to the end of this video i appreciate you and thanks to everyone who supports the channel either over on patreon at patreon.com tortoise youtube channel members twitch subscribers all those people are great. I love them. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.